thank you to the organization for inviting me here to come and uh, tell you um, more information about human multiple to those the gender cells. So, I, as a disclaimer, I have to say that I am a consultant to the company Atresis, um, which is the company that actually commercializes this uh, product, and I will just show you one slide of different trials that are going. Um, but I'm a consultant and I have no stock in the company. So I'm actually starting off the section of regenerative medicine. And so regenerative medicine, you can define as the process of replacing or regenerating human cells, tissues, or organs to restore or establish normal function. There's actually two ways that you can do this. One way is to regenerate damaged tissue and organs in the body by replacing the damaged tissue, which you probably will hear from, uh, from the next two speakers who are talking about IBS, he's the last speaker. The alternative way would be to come up with methods to stimulate the body's own repair mechanisms to heal previously irreparable tissues or organs. And that's what I'm going to actually talk, uh, explain to you a little bit more. So in contrast to the next two speakers who will be speaking about uh, stem cells, I'm going to talk about a cell that comes out of adult tissues, which is called multipotent adult progenitor cells. And I would like to cover with you uh, what are multipotent adult progenitor cells, and do they differ from other adherent stem cells, which are also used uh, in many settings, more specifically mesenchymal stem cells that can be harvested from the bone marrow or from fat tissue. Then the second question is, what is the effect of MAPSIS on inflammation, the immune system, and tissue regeneration, mainly in cardiovascular diseases? As I said, the last slide I'll show you are the clinical trials that are running, um, finished are running with the clinical MAPC um, product multi-stem. So the data that I will show is actually all apart from academic laboratories. So what are mesenchymal stem cells? Well, they were first described as fibroblast colony forming cells by um, uh, um, Friedstein uh, in 1974. They were renamed by Arnold Kaplan in, two, in 1999 as mesenchymal stem cells. And stem cells, uh, they were actually only identified as such in 2007, and Paolo Bianco demonstrated that they are truly self-immune stem cells. These cells are being used in academic centers, but also by a number of uh, in, by, um, by technology companies to either treat or repair mesenchymal um, tissues, like tendons, cartilage, and bone, but also as source of trophic factors in ischemia and immune diseases. In the beginning of 2000, a very large number of groups have then described uh, cells that could be isolated from bone marrow, from fat tissue, from cord blood, and so forth, that had some properties of mesenchymal stem cells, but seemed to have a much more broad differentiation ability. We call these, name, these cells multipotent adult progenitor cells, but you can see on the list here that any acronym, um, that many, many different acronyms have been used for somewhat similar cells, probably. So what do we call MAPCs and are they different from MSCs? So Valerie Robuk, a PhD student in my lab, actually set about to answer that question by taking bone marrow cells um, from individuals and growing them either under conditions that are typical for mesenchymal stem cells or conditions that are typical for MAPCs and actually have characterized the cells. One thing that you can see is that the morphology of the cells is different, but that doesn't tell us very much. What we did find, however, is that if you look at how well you can expand mesenchymal stem cells, that you can do this for 20, 30 passages. But if you do this under MAPC conditions, and if you use the conditions that we have developed, that you can expand the cells to 70, 80 passages, which is quite significantly more. And so that's one of the major benefits of this cell population, is that you can make from one single donor enormous amounts of doses that you can make of um, um, master cell bank, and you can actually use working cell banks to treat patients. The reasons that potentially are related to the fact that if, for instance, in mesenchymal stem cells, telomere length, telomere as the, the telomerase activity very quickly drops once you have the cells in culture, whereas if you have them under MAPC conditions, passage 10, passage 20, and passage 30, you see there's a small drop off. But you also see that compared to human embryonic stem cells, the telomerase activity, the telomerase, the telomerase activity is not as high, that's also the reason why you have a plateau at 70 to 80 population doublings, and we also don't have the problem of teratomas and tumor formation. 
If you don't ask what can the cells do, so mesenchymal stem cells can make bone, adipocytes, chondrocytes, and smooth muscle cells, and multiple and double gender cells can do the same. Where they actually are significantly different is in the fact that they can make endothelial cells. And they can do this in vitro, but also in vivo, and these are studies from Arnold Newton, who was a postdoc in my lab, where he actually took multiple double gender cells, put them in matri gel, put this under the meat of a new mouse, and these are human cells, and after 21 days, you take the matrix gel blood back out. And if you do this, and you have put mesenchymal stem cells in, you can see here that you don't find very many good, and not very many good blood vessels, and that the blood vessels are leaky because you have small bruises here, and this on histology. However, if you use multiple adult progenitor cells, you have good, beautiful blood vessels, and the blood vessels are not leaky. And the reason for that is that these cells can make and endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells that actually make very strong uh, blood vessels. If you then ask at a more global level how much different are similar RD cells, uh, we knew that they were not embryonic stem cells, so they obviously differ. But you can also see that mesenchymal stem cells and MAPCs, and also the clinical grade MAPC multi-stem, actually are significantly different. If you then ask where, uh, what, are the diff what are some of the genes that are differenti differentially expressed, you can actually see that the angiogenic capability of these MAPCs shows up in the fact that you have uh, angiopoietin like 1, angiopoietin like 4, and a number of other molecules that actually have to do with angiogenesis. So I think we believe that those cells are different and that the advantages of MAPCs over MSCs are at least that MAPCs can be expanded significantly more extensively than MSCs. And they have a broader differentiation potential in this sense that they can make endothelial cells and very strong blood vessels in people. So I'm not going to go through all the data. A lot of it has been published for a few years ago or just recently this year. MSCs, I have told you, have a significant effect on inflammation and immunological response. And we show that MAPCs have the same, whether that's better, I'm not convinced that that is the case, but we're still uh, looking at a number of different questions. The two uh, models, the three models I'd actually like to show are these. So these are actually ischemia, this is ischemic disorders. In ischemia, you have obviously blood vessels that disappear, you have the surrounding tissue, the brain, the heart muscle, skeletal muscle that disappears, and you also have a massive inflammatory and um, immune reaction to the ischemic event in the organ because everything is dying. So the question is then, what do MAPCs do in these conditions? And so what I'll show you first is in uh, cardiac muscle, and in this model, we actually used uh, mice, but also swine. And so we took pigs and actually caused a, um, we, cut, we put the suture around the, uh, the descending artery here. And then we took um, MAPCs and we gave five injections of 10 to the 7 cells in the border zone around the infarct. And then we evaluated the pig over time to try to understand whether we helped the pig or not. What you can see, the cells were uh, like Z positive, that there is very few cells at a month that we can find back. Just the, so the cells don't seem to survive very well. Some of these, well, these are all allogenic cells. We gave them to pigs that had immunosuppression and cytosporin or not, but actually the survival of the cells seemed to not be dependent on that. And this has been shown in other groups. Maybe once in a while we found a cell that would be double positive for like C and a cardiac muscle marker or like C and an endothelial marker, but this was very rare. Nevertheless, when we asked whether uh, the blood vessels in the region, in the infarct itself and the region around the infarct was increased after injection of the cells, you can see that indeed the injection of the cells with or without cytosporine increased the amount of blood vessels in the infarct zone as well as in the zone around the infarct. If you then ask whether there was an effect on the function of the heart, meaning the ejection fraction, you can see that adding stem cells with or without cytosporin in improved uh, ejection fraction in these pigs compared to pigs that were treated with saline. If we ask whether the infarct zone itself could take so the muscle contracts that the zones, that actually the, the, the diameter of the muscle should be bigger, you can see in the infarct zone that if you have not given the um, animals any cells, that there was actually no movement almost in the infarct zone, 
but this was significantly improved uh, with NAPC, with or without us, as Cyprus already. And the other thing that we measured is how well the energetic characteristics were in the border zone uh, around the infarct, and again, pigs that precede cells, uh, with or without cytosporinase, seem to be doing better. So we concluded from that study, and then the company has followed up on that study in uh, additional studies, is that allogeneic multistem seems to improve ejection fraction and limit the border zone functional and bioenergetic deterioration that follows myocardial infarcts. However, very few of these cells survive, and the contribution to endothelium cardiomyocytes is very limited. So the possible mechanisms, which I think is for many of the stem cell therapies currently, is that there's trophic effects from the transplanted cells that make it such that there is increased blood flow reserve, resulting in increased border zone capillary density and increased border zone function. And what I didn't show here, and that I'll show you in some of the other models, is that we also have significantly decreased inflammation in the infarct zone. So the second model is uh, chronic limits, uh, critical limb ischemia. So that in patients with diabetes or patients with hypercholesterolemia, obviously in mouse models, we don't use mice with these diseases. Here again, we actually um, stop the blood flow in the iliac artery or femoral artery. Then we have done two sets of studies where we have either used immune deficient mice that received human cells, MAPCs, versus human endothelial progenitor cells, which theoretically should be a good source of cells to treat this, or mouse into mouse, and here we use mouse MAPCs versus mouse bone marrow cells because there are a number of clinical trials running currently where bone marrow cells are used to treat patients with critical limb ischemia. We followed the perfusion in the limb of these animals. We had the, either the animals swim or run on a treadmill to see how good the function of the limb was, and then we did histology. Shown here are mouse and mouse studies, um, where in red is the spontaneous improved blood flow to the paw of these animals over a period of 21 days after we uh, blocked the circulation. In red here, you can see that this is associated with a progressive increase in the ability of the mouse to swim. But however, still 5 out of 50 mice that were treated with saline uh, actually had tonicosis, which would mean that people that didn't then have to amputate the limb. The limb. If you gave them MAPCs, you can see that the blood perfusion is significantly improved, which is associated with a significant improvement in the swimming capacity of the mice, and also in the fact that we actually did not see any necrosis in, these, uh, in the limbs of these mice. We were very surprised when we looked at bone marrow cells, where we had an initial improvement and then a loss, which is shown here, and which also is shown here by the fact that 11 of the mice actually had necrotic dose. And this, we think, is due to the fact that if you don't remove the immune component from the bone marrow graft, that it actually fuels the inflammatory system in the limb, and that it actually may make the disease worse. Now, if we then look at what happens, what we do see is that there is a significant increase in both endothelial cells and for MAPCs also smooth muscle cells, suggesting that MAPCs induce uh, both uh, capillaries as well as small arterioles, whereas endothelial precursor cells, this top lane here, really makes only the more capillaries, but don't, does not really support the uh, generation of uh, small arterioles. And this is true for the mouse models, for the, the mouse in mouse and human in mouse. If you look at this here, so if we give PDS to the uh, mice, what we see is that there's a lot of fibrosis that occurs. First, there's a lot of necrosis, followed by fibrosis and relatively limited myogenesis. If you give human MAPCs, the necrosis is significantly reduced, which then leads to significantly less fibrosis. And interestingly, the cells also seem to stimulate the skeletal muscle to um, repair itself. And you can see that endothelial progenitor cells are somewhere in between. So similar to what we found in the heart, what we show here is that mouse and human MAPCs Injected in the muscle of mice with critical limb ischemia significantly improves perfusion and function of the limb. Um, only limited numbers of cells again uh, survive, and we see some contribution to endothelial smooth muscle and skeletal muscle, but that's very limited. So here again, we think that the same reasons why this is working is not so much because we replace tissue, but because we activate endogenous repair mechanisms. The final example is in stroke in the brain. 
So here, um, we actually did uh, middle cerebral artery occlusion and transplanted human MSCs versus human MSCs in the penumbra, so in the region around the stroke in the brain, again, in immune deficient animals, and analyzed uh, the brains of these mice to see uh, what, function, what histological effects we could find. And the story is actually quite similar to the other three. So if you transplant MSCs or MAPCs in the brain, you can see that the percent tissue loss is decreased compared to the saline control. There is um, not much difference between MSCs and MAPCs. If you then ask, and I don't know how well it shows up, how well the uh, neoangiogenesis is in the um, region around the stroke, you can see that this spontaneously goes up following stroke and then comes back down. If you add human mesenchymal stem cells, that is increased, and if you add human multicolored adult progenitor cells, that effect is significantly higher yet. So there's much quicker and much more extensive revascularization of the tissue. The neural stem cells are present in the subventricular zone, and these can be seen here on these semi-thin sections. You can see that if you have a stroke and you don't um, give any cells, that there maybe is a slight expansion of this zone, but by seven days and 28 days, there's actually no further expansion of the cells, which means that there is proliferation of neural stem cells in the subventricular zone. This is more pronounced with MSCs, and again, even more pronounced with MAPCs, which is quantified here, so it's really the same again. You have an extended increase in the beginning with the sham, which is more pronounced when human MSCs are given and even more pronounced when human MAPCs are given. Finally, here to look at inflammation, what we did is ask the question how, how activated the microglia are. So these are resting microglia that have long tentacles. Activated my microglia actually contract themselves. And you can see that if you give MSCs or MAPCs, that you can more easily find these cells that are non activated, and this is quantified down here, showing that if you do saline MSCs versus MAPCs, again, there's a trend towards a progressive improvement. And also in another test shown here, where we actually make concentric rings around the body of the cell and ask how many rings these um, tentacles can um, cross, enumerate that. We can also show that um, in the human MAPCs, there is and MSCs, there's an improvement or a decrease in inflammation. Not shown here is that we also see a decrease in um, uh, in astrocytic scar. So as in AMI and, and critical limit ischemia, neural MAPCs and multi stems have beneficial effects in an acute occlusion, uh, middle cerebral occlusion model, decreased scar formation, decreased inflammation, and enhanced angiogenesis and endogenous neurogenesis. The, is actually also evidence that if you give the cells IV, that maybe similar trophy effects can be noted in the brain. So the conclusions are that human MAPCs and the clinical counterpart multi-stem and single stem cells are distinct. The advantages of MAPCs and multi-stems are that they have significantly greater uh, expansion potential than MSCs. There is a differentiation difference between MAPCs and MSCs in the sense that only MAPCs can make endothelial cells in vivo and in vitro. How important this is for the clinical effects that we see is not totally clear. Uh, and this, this, we can actually now have a signature or gene signature actually that will allow us to say these are more MSC-like or these will be more MAPC-like. Now, one thing I should point out is that we also published uh, over the last years about rodent MAPCs, so MAPCs isolated from mouse and rat bone marrow, which actually has um, become very clear over the last four to five years that this, these cells are actually quite different from the human cells, and that these cells are actually cells that come from the bone marrow that appear to be spontaneously de-differentiated to a very early embryonic cell, namely a hypoblast stem cell and not an epiblast stem cell, which you will be hearing on, from the next speakers. This happens spontaneously without putting genetic material in the cell. It's not due, for, as far as we can tell, because of mutation. It is extremely inefficient. And actually, we haven't been able to do this in human yet. So these very early cells, uh, and we can now actually isolate the same cells immediately from the blastocyst, these cells that could potentially be used for regenerative medicine, as they can make hepatocytes, and we have evidence that they can make is the producing cells. But so these cells are road specific currently and we don't have them in human. So therefore we in the future try to not 
confuse the terminology that we're going to call these bone derived hypoases and the human cells who made MAPSIs. So the human MAPSIs or multi step are at least as effective in modulating the autoimmunity and inflammation as mesenchymal stem cells. And human MAPSIs inhibit inflammation, improve perfusion, and support endogenous tissue regeneration and ischemia. This seems to be better than, than MSCs in stroke, and seems to be better than endothelial progenitor cells and unmanipulated bone marrow bone nuclear cells in peripheral vascular ischemia. Just to let you know what the company Emphasis is actually doing with the technology, so they have finished an acute myocardial infarct trial in the, in the United States. The studies are being um, written up. They have done a multi-dosing anti-GHD trial in the US as well as here in the UK in Belgium. And they have two ongoing phase two clinical trials, one in the US for ischemic stroke, one together with Pfizer in the US and in Europe for um, ulcerative colitis. And the clinical trial will be planned for critical ischemia in Europe. I would like to thank here the people in my lab who contributed to the data that I showed. Obviously, many collaborations at KU, many collaborations elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, uh, regarding this uh, renewal of stem cells uh, to maintain the population, stem cells must divide asymmetrically. Uh, how is it regulated? And also, in your experience, is it uh, restored this uh, stem cell population, or they just differentiate? So, since we can expand the cell with a specific phenotype, we believe that they must be dividing symmetrically in the laboratory. But we have to be looked at that carefully. It's the same for embryonic stem cells in this way, both stem cells. You can maintain the cells. Obviously, they tend to want to differentiate all the time. So you have to be careful to not allow them to do so. But I don't think, well, my lab for sure hasn't looked at um, precise mechanism that underlies the apparent symmetric cell, renewal cell division that must be occur in the laboratory. Which is a very artificial system because you know, I don't know how these cells in vivo, what the growth factors are that support them. You know, if you look at MSCs, um, Paul Simmons has data that these are extremely quiescent, like hematopoietic stem cells, like many other stem cells in vivo. So this is a very artificially in vitro system that you know, makes these cells all of a sudden wake up out of G0 and induce them to proliferate and do this in a, what we think must be a relatively symmetrical um, cell division fashion. Okay. Andre? Uh, so what do you think at the moment is the relationship in vivo in humans between MAPSIs and MSCs? Do you think MAPSIs sometimes differentiate into MSCs as their first step in many um, restrictions? So either MAPSIs are a subpopulation of MSCs or they're the precursor for MSCs in vivo, and so that's something that we don't, you know, we don't, we, can, we, we don't have any markers yet to pull them out from in vivo. So MSCs have been pulled out by Paolo, Paolo Bianco, but on C146, but so we haven't really done the same experiment to try to identify the marker. In vitro, we have differentially expressed markers between MAPSIs and MSCs, but we haven't gone to the human to try to pull them out and say that they can be called MSCs. But so we think they're either a subpopulation or the precursor that has broad mesodermal potential. As I mentioned, in the mouse and the rats, it's a whole different story. Dairy, it's a culture quote artifact, meaning reprogramming a culture. Any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much for this interesting lecture.